Well, greetings once again from Cooperstown, New York, site of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum, and also the site of the latest installment of our virtual author series. Welcome, everybody. We are glad that you could join us. I know we have a lot of returning folks, but also some new folks uh, joining us uh, via Zoom and on Facebook. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for being part of the program. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Bruce Marcus, and I work in the education department here at the Baseball Hall of Fame. And today it'll be my pleasure to talk to our special guest as part of our virtual author series. His name, Tom Zappala, and he is the co-author of Baseball and Bubblegum, the 1952 Tops Collection. Now, I say co-author because uh, another important person helped write uh, the book along with Tom. And that is Tom's uh, wife, Ellen. Ellen would prefer to be behind the scenes. So we wanted to give Ellen some credit by putting her picture, nice picture of Tom and Ellen. That was when Tom was clean shaven. Today, you look a little <laughs> bit different, Tom. How, how no, are you doing? It's, it's the COVID stuff. That's the problem. It's the COVID stuff. But uh, uh, everything is well. Thanks for having us, Bruce, or having me. I greatly appreciate it. So the, the beard is relatively new. Uh, it is. Stick with it. I think so. Uh, I've had, yeah. I've, you know, I've, I've taken a survey. There's, there's been more co uh, positive comments than negative. So until Ellen is the one that tells me to shave it off, then I'll keep it. Well, that's a good strategy to take. <laughs> uh, well, we do welcome you to the program. Thank and you. we uh, certainly congratulate you and Ellen on the book. It has been uh, selling very well. Uh, it's been selling particularly well here at the Baseball Hall of Fame. And it is a book that uh, folks can purchase. We're going to put up the link in our Zoom group chat. In fact, Stephanie Hazard has just put it up right now. So you can purchase not only the book, but an author signed copy of Baseball and Bubblegum, the 1952 Tops Collection. And the link there will take you to our website and directly to our online store. Tom, as we begin, let's start with a very basic question for almost any author we have here. Why did you and Ellen choose to write about this set, the 1952 Tops Collection? I mean, I have some ideas as to why you may have done it, but they may differ from what I'm thinking. What, what was your reasoning here? Well, actually, Bruce, there were, there were actually two different reasons. Number one, um, some people know that uh, we, uh, the big three in baseball card collection uh, are the T206 set, uh, followed by the Cracker Jack, uh, the Gaudi, 1933 Gaudi, and then probably the 1952 Tops. But uh, the primary reason that uh, that I wrote, or we wrote the book, because it was it was right in our fabric. I mean, that's how we grew up, and we just thought that uh, you know that combined with the fact that uh, one of the most iconic cards in in the hobby is in the collection. Uh, it, you know, made for a perfect setting to, to, to choose this subject uh, as a book. Uh, so there were, there were a lot of reasons. The other thing was that for this particular set, uh, again, it was the setting was perfect because, uh, you know, we were just coming out of World War II. Uh, the Korean War was just ending. Uh, the, the, the baseball color barrier had been broken. Um, the economy was, was, was coming back. And then this electronic device called the television uh, was pretty, pretty, pretty much in the fabric of everybody's uh, uh, home. So it was really, it, for the first time, people actually were able to see their heroes sitting in their living room couches watching baseball. So it was just a, it was a perfect time uh, for the for the collection to come out. It was a perfect as a perfect perfect setting for the book. Well, that certainly makes a lot of sense. It's an historic set. It's actually not the first set that Topps put out. They put out a set one year earlier. Correct. That was really a disaster, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. But the '52 set was one that really created the template for the modern day baseball card and really changed the industry in many ways, I think many positive ways as well. Now, Tom, prior to Topps, a different company, Bauman, had really cornered the market on baseball cards. This was in the late 1940s and continuing Correct. into the early 1950s. Were there any 
parts of the Bauman production, though, that maybe made them vulnerable? Uh, well, I think that I, I I don't know if it made them. Yeah, I guess I guess the answer, Bruce, is yes. Um, it wasn't. Uh, the cards were they're, they're beautiful cards, as you know. Uh, Bowman started in uh, 1948, and and they and Tops went back and forth, back and forth. But I think the difference was uh, b- the difference between Bowman and the Tops card is if you look at the size of the Bowman set, the Bowman series, they're much smaller. Mm-hmm. Uh, the tops, the 52 tops, you know, they made a statement. The card is much b- bigger. The colors are much more vivid. And uh, Cy Berger, you know, he, he came up with a great marketing plan and a game plan. So I think it was just a matter of time. And as I said, the two companies went back and forth uh, for, I think, until 1956 and then Tops finally bought Bowman L. You make a good point about the size of the cards. Obviously, when people look at the images on the screen, they are deceptively large. But the Bowman cards were smaller than the Tops, which basically were, I believe, well, and they always have been, two and a half by three and a half. So these cards were smaller. The colors, pretty good, but not as vibrant as you say. Now, let's talk a little bit more about Cy Berger, because... 1951 was a difficult year for Topps. This was when Topps decided to first take on Bauman with their own set, their own uh, inaugural set of cards. They were a bubblegum company primarily Correct. at that point. And they put out the Redbacks and the Bluebacks. These cards were not visually attractive. They were Correct. really part of a game that was kind of a boring game. Yep. Kids did not like them. They did not sell well. So they turned out to be a financial disaster. Cyberger could have packed it in and said, hey, we're not going to risk this again. And yet he was willing to go back to the drawing board with Woody Gelbin, his artistic man, yep. and come up with a new set in 1952. Tell us more about that. Well, I think I think you're hitting it right on the head. I mean, uh, Cy and Woody, you know, they took a step back. And basically, both of those guys, Cy especially, put everything on the table. I mean, he he pretty much put his career on the table. And um, he came up with uh, just a great design. Both of them, he and Woody, came up with a great design. And they basically rolled the dice and it, it paid off for them. Um, as, you know, as, as, as you're showing on the screen right now, I mean, look at those vivid, gorgeous colors uh, of those cards. So I, I think that once, once they, you know, they, they came out with this particular set, I think it pretty much... Um, was the swan song for Bauman. Um, you know, they did manage to, 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 you know, operate for a couple more years, but this set really was the set that made the statement. And as you said earlier, this is the, uh, this was the launch of the modern card collections. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Cy did a good job. And, you know, uh, it's interesting because I know that, <clears throat> I don't know if uh, a lot of our listeners uh, I mean, viewers, uh, you know, Cy, Cy Berger was, was Mr. Tops, but Cy Berger was also the guy that would go from team to team signing players mm-hmm. to Tops contracts. And uh, he was very, very, very well loved. I mean, he was well respected. They all liked him. He would joke around with the players. Um, Cy's son, Glenn, uh, my, my partner, my, my radio and uh, podcast partner, had a uh, had an opportunity to sit with him, and we had lunch with him. And the stories uh, he told us were just fantastic about Cy. And uh, his name is Glenn Berger. Glenn lives up here in New Hampshire, not too far from us, actually. And uh, you know, Cy was really Mr. Tops. He was Mr. Tops. Well, he made agreements with four hundred seven of the players, and as you said, he did this like going to spring training, going into the clubhouses, talking to the players on a one-to-one basis. Absolutely. So he was able to get most of the major leaguers, 407 at the time, and that was much larger than the Bauman set. Let's go back, though, for a moment, Tom, to what you mentioned in terms of this prototype for the modern-day baseball card. Some of the elements that he included, uh, you have a facsimile signature, you have a team logo, you... Um, you have a, a format that 
well, sure, these cards are different than the cards of today. In many of the general ways, they're very much the same. The size, the basic format, uh, the way the cards are laid out, a lot of that is still pretty similar to what we see in 2020. Absolutely. And if you flip the card over, I mean, there is there is a, a great deal more uh, uh, information on the player on the backs of the 52s as opposed to any prior cards. Uh, you know, you've got stats, you've got little uh, tidbits about the player. And that's really, really, really important because I think that piqued people's interest initially when they when they, you know, bought the bought the cards. I mean, they just they just it's a cool it's a really cool piece, you know, and you flip the card over and there's 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 information that about the player that that uh, is, is, is good. You know, I don't have any Bauman cards in my collection, so I don't think I've actually ever seen the back of a Bauman card. What would be on it? Uh, actually, next to nothing. There's a brief, small little narrative, and and that's about it. Uh, mm. uh, it, it they're, they're they're really kind kind of a boring card, to be quite quite honest with you. Um, no statistics at all. Nah, no. On, on the fifty one Bowman, I'm uh, I'm trying to think. No, I don't think so. On the fifty-one Bowman, they may have just a lifetime stat of the of the car of the player. I'm not one hundred percent sure, but I think possibly not. Okay, so relatively little information compared to what Top started doing in 1952. Absolutely, and keep this in mind. You know, Cy, um, he developed unlike the Bowman people he really developed close relationships with these players. So he was able to, you know, he was able to establish relationships, get more information out of them, gain their trust. Uh, and, you know, he would get them to sign uh, four tops. And again, by the way, I, I have to refer back to, uh, to my partner, Rico Petroselli, uh, Red Sox Hall of Famer. Rico, uh, Cy, Cy signed Rico. So I asked Rico, I said, so, you know, unlike today, I mean, you know, players sign with, with the big card companies, they get, they get paid millions and millions of dollars. I said, so Rico, I said, so how much did you get paid? And he looked at me and he said, Cy would walk around with a catalog, very similar to an S&H green stamp catalog and say to, Rico, say to the players, here, pick something out. There may be a stereo, there may be a set of golf clubs, uh, things like that. And Rico said he picked out a stereo. <laughs> <laughs> so that was his compensation. Wow. Exactly. To sign, to sign for tops. Yeah. And Rico came around a little bit later than the 1950s. He did. So he might have actually been getting a little bit more in than terms these of gentlemen. The quality product. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, by 1956, only four years after this set comes out, Tops is successful enough that they're able to buy out Bauman and establish their own monopoly, and that would continue until 1981. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. So it was all part of Cyberger's plan, and it it uh, was. He did. No, the yeah. guy, the guy was. Uh, he was really a marketing uh, genius. You know, unfortunately, uh, you know, it's really interesting because, as you know, uh, Bruce, the, the the 52 top series. The, the collection came out in six different series, card numbers from like 1 to 80, 81 to 130, 131 to 190, all the way from and then up to 3, 311 to 407. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, and again, I, I don't know if you if you want to discuss the dump, but, uh, you know, by the time the last series of the set came out, it was towards the end of the season. Little kids were back to school. Uh, the season was ending, so sales weren't good in stores. So Cy couldn't give them away. He could not give the cards away. So he, it got to the point where he even offered, I think, either 10 or 20 for a penny to stores, and they still wouldn't take them. So he had all of these excess cards, especially uh, the – 311 to 407, and one Miss, Mr. Mickey Mantle happens to be card number 311. Uh, he, uh, he rented a barge and took the 
unsold crates of 1952 tops and dumped them into the ocean. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if that hurt or helped. It probably helped because, uh, you know, that particular card is so rare to find. But, you know, I mean, that's how bad it got for the series. However, as things continued, 53, 54, 55, as you say, they were wildly successful. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, that whole idea of selling cards in series and waiting until nearly the end of the season when some kids have moved on to football or maybe Absolutely. basketball and hockey. Uh, it certainly contributed to the scarcity of this Mickey Mantle card. Absolutely. But let's talk about some other things. This, I, I guess, is regarded as his rookie card, uh, correct? It is. Uh, there's, there's some controversy about it, but this is considered the Mickey, his rookie card. Um, there is a 1951 Bauman and Mickey Mantle, and actually there's a 1952 Bauman and Mickey Mantle. But uh, this card has always been considered the, the rookie card. And I think it has to do, quite frankly, I, just I think it has to do with the marketing on Topps part, plus the fact that it is um, visually, it's a much more appealing card than both the 51 and 52 Bauman. I think that's basically the bottom line. However, with that being said, in my opinion, I think the 51 Bauman mantle is a card to keep your eye on hmm. for the future. I really honestly believe that. Interesting. Now, we look at the 52 mantle from Tops. It's really a black and white photograph that's been colorized. Correct. But much better than the uh, Ted Turner colorization attempts back in the 1980s. <laughs> this is Absolutely. nicely done. It looks good. And when you see it from a distance, you actually probably think it's a color photograph, even though it is drawn in. Absolutely. And that particular pose of Mick, I mean, you know, that look represents everything that baseball fans looked up to uh, at that time. I mean, he looks, just looks like confident. He's strong. He has that look in his eye, looking off to the side. Uh, you know, it's just a great card. And it's a very expensive card. <laughs> yeah. You can also see the strength in his hands, gripping Absolutely. The, uh, what appears to be a yellow bat. Yes. I'm not sure if he actually used a yellow bat. That colorization may be a little bit inaccurate, but um, you can see the strength uh, that Mantle had and that uh, that he brought uh, in just in terms of his physical image. I mean, he was in many ways the epitome of what a ball player should look like. Absolutely. Uh, there is another ball player today, Mike Trout. A lot of people compare the way Mike Trout looks physically compared to, to Mickey Mantle. And that's why people gravitate towards Mike Trout. But this Mantle card is just, I mean, this image of Mantle is just iconic. That's the word. You have one of these in your collection? I do not. Uh, you know, it's funny because I do have quite a few uh, 52 tops, but the collection that I've been working on for going on 35 years is the T206 collection. Mm. Yeah, I've uh, I've been I you know that was a passion of mine at the very beginning. That's why we wrote the first book, the T206 collection, uh, the players and their stories. But I have really started gravitating towards 52 tops. I'm really enjoying them. Uh, you know, once we started researching the book, the other thing about the book about the players, Bruce, that I found actually Ellen and I both found really really intriguing, is I mentioned at the very beginning that. Um, a lot of these players had were, had either fought in World War II or in the Korean War. Mm. It's amazing, absolutely amazing, how many of them served our country, number one, and how many of them were actually war heroes and, uh, and wounded in battle. I mean, there were some amazing, amazing stories. Uh, off the, let me just uh, off the top of my head. Uh, and I have a few notes here. Uh, this uh, Frank Baum, uh, I'm sorry, Gene Bearden, good example. This is a guy that served on the USS Helena. He got wounded, wound up with a metal plate in his skull, a metal hinge in his knee. 
Yet he comes back in 19, and plus he was in chronic pain. He comes back in 1948 and goes 20 and seven and wins, wow. you know, two or three games in the World Series. I mean, those are the kinds of stories um, that I personally love. Uh, this guy, Frank Baumholtz, two, 290, you know, batting average, a hero. I mean, an absolute hero. Billy Pierce, uh, he pitched for the White Sox and, uh, uh, you know, later on. Uh, and here's a guy, I'm sorry, uh, it was uh, my, my mistake. I'm sorry, it was Maury Martin. Here's a guy that was wounded in World War II. He was shot. He had shrapnel uh, in his body. He actually suffered frostbite. Mm -hmm. And his, his leg was so, in, so damaged on D-Day that on the battlefield, they were going to amputate his leg. Wow. And a nurse, a field nurse, convinced one of the doctors to let's before because he got an infection before we amputate let's try this new drug it's called penicillin and they gave him penicillin and he recuperated remember what i just said the shrapnel he recuperated and wound up pitching in the major leagues you know he he won 30 30 he won, i think he won 34 and 32 uh, and pitch for seven or eight different teams and live to be 87 years old. Yeah. Those are the types of stories that really piqued our interest because these players came from all walks of life. Uh, you know, some of them, you know, ob obviously most of them had to work odd jobs or, you know, in the off season because, you know, they didn't make that much money. So the narratives of the player players with this particular series, really, really, we found very, very interesting. Speaking of the military, here is a man who served in the military during the Korean War, Willie Mays. Mm -hmm. He is part of that great 1952 top set. Let's talk a little bit about this card, another visually striking card. It's a beautiful card. Uh, I think I think the, the problem with the Mays card is the mantle card, uh, you know, for popularity. I mean, it's just it's a gorgeous card. Uh, I think that's a card, in my opinion, that is a little underrated, and again, it's 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 been overshadowed by by uh, you know card number three eleven uh, Mickey Mantle. But that's a gorgeous card. Uh, you know, can't say enough about Willie Mays. Uh, you know, probably in the top five greatest players of all time, five two player, and it's just a wonderful wonderful card. This card was not part of that final series. So Correct. I believe it was not involved in that dump that you mentioned earlier. Right. So that perhaps created more of these cards. That may have been a factor. People it, have also talked about the factor of, of race, the fact that we have an African-American ball player. Maybe that has hurt the value of the card. Maybe that Absolutely. It, you're, 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 you're 100 percent right. Um, you know, at the time, unfortunately, you know, uh, Jackie had you know broken the color barrier in '47, but racism in this country was still rant. Well, it, it was it was really rampant at that time in 1952. And I think you're right. I think that the Mays card, the fact that Willie was an African American, had a lot to do with his card not being as popular. Absolutely. Willie, of course, is um, still with us uh, in is. his mid 80s. Uh, he's an amazing man, amazing career. Uh, I'm not really old enough to remember having seen Mickey Mantle play. I've heard stories from my family that when I was three and when he was uh, introduced on WPIX by the announcers that I would jump up and down and yell and scream, but I have no memory of this. I, I have, the have memories of watching Willie Mays play toward the yeah. end, both with the Giants and with the Mets. And even though he was not in his prime, this early 70s, you could still see remnants of the greatness, the way that he ran the bases, the way that he camped under fly balls. Even at a later age, you could tell there was something special about him. Absolutely agree with you. I, I can remember um, he played for the 69 Mets, I believe, right? Yeah, I think oh, he 73 did. Mets. 73 Mets, okay. 73 Mets. He played for the 73 Mets, and I can remember he was a shell of his former self. However, as you're as your, as your, saying i mean he he would get i think he he basically played on one leg and he just gave it a hundred percent hundred percent and the same thing with mickey i mean i saw mickey probably a dozen times at fenway park and towards the end of his career 
uh, 68. Uh, I think he was, that was his last year, but I saw Mick at, you know, 67, 66. And I mean, he really had no wheels at the time either, but you could just see, you could just see in, in, in the way he played the game, he realized as did Willie that they didn't have the skills that they had 10 or 15 years earlier, but they still gave it 110%. Yeah. A lot of people do remember Mays in the 73 series when he really struggled. Yeah. But if you go back even two years earlier, 1971, he was still a very good player. And he was a big reason why the San Francisco Giants won the National League West before Absolutely. eventually uh, losing to the world champion Pirates. So, and that was a heck of a team. That was yeah. one heck of a ball club, that uh, San Francisco team. He had, there was some studs in that team. Yeah. Four Hall of Famers, Mays, right. McCovey, Gaylord Perry. And of course, Juan Marichal. So two sure. hitters, two pitchers, um, a pretty pretty good team that uh, lost in the championship series. Uh, another great player, part of that 1952 set uh, shown here, the great Jackie Robinson. I love the bright red background that really makes this card pop at you. Not only that, but if you look at that picture, I mean, he's just the smile on his face. Uh, you know, he looks... He just like you could you can just tell he loves the game. He loves the game. Again, another card that is a very popular card. But again, I think uh, the the African American uh, factor comes in here also with Jackie. Again, it's a it's a very popular card. And it's a very expensive card. I'm not sure what the value is in a in a PSA nine. But uh, you know, it's a, it really is. It's a great great card. Jackie was still pretty young at this point. You know, he yeah. debuted at 28 in 1947. So he's around 32, 33. Um, hasn't really started to put on too much weight. We would see that later in his career, but uh, still quite youthful. And as you say, uh, he's absolutely beaming uh, in this photograph. So all three of the cards, uh, Robinson, Mays, Mantle, you could make it a Mount Rushmore of 1952 tops. If absolutely. You'd like. Now, mm -hmm. on the other hand, Tom, there are some omissions from the 52 top set. There are. Inevitably, people will always ask the question, why is there not a card of Stan Musial? Why is there not a card of Ted Williams? Why were they left out of this top set? Well, actually, you know, so I'm going to throw a third guy in there, and that's Joe DiMaggio, because Joe had, I believe, retired the year before. But Musial uh, uh, is not in the, in, the, in the series because he was uh, tied into a uh, contract. Uh, and as a result, he couldn't participate uh, in the 52 series because he was still under contract with the other, other company. And as far as Ted goes, Ted was fighting a war. I mean, Ted, Ted uh, basically missed the 52 season uh, as a jet fighter uh, in, uh, in Korea. So those are two, two great players, uh, quite frankly, probably the two best players uh, – in that of that year, uh, I'm, I'm, of that generation, mm -hmm. two of the best players of that generation. Um, obviously, you have to include Mays and a few other ones, but uh, yeah, that they they were left out. They're out of the uh, out of that collection. So interesting. Uh, Musil was with the Bauman Company. Correct. Uh, Ted was not under contract to another company simply because they did they knew he wasn't going to play. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Which you know it would have been nice to see both of those guys uh, in the collection, but. Unfortunately, uh, not. You know, the other thing, uh, if you pay close attention to the um, to the set, there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of variations to the set. Uh, there's some errors. There's some kind of whimsical uh, 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 images, if you want to call them that. Um, I don't know. The Gus Zerniel. Are you familiar with the Gus Zerniel card? Yeah. You know, it, it looks like there's six baseballs floating in air uh, in, in, in front of him. Yeah. And I believe I don't have the card in front of me, but I believe he has a pink undershirt on. I believe I, I could be wrong in that one. But, you know, that's kind of a, a, a that's kind of a, a good example of what we're talking about, because um, for our you know, for you folks that are watching, I'm sure most of you know this, but the reason that the six balls were kind of in the air is because uh, prior to that, uh, he had hit the year before, uh, he had hit, I believe, six home runs in a row or six home runs in three games. And 
those represented the the uh, uh, the home runs. So you know, there's a lot of little things like that. Um, there's a lot, lot of little misprints uh, that you can find. I mean, you could you could actually get a popsicle headache uh, finding uh, the little er uh, errors and variations. Um, I think the the error card with uh, I believe it was uh, was a Johnny Sane and uh, who else? Oh, I can't. Uh, Joe Page. Joe Page. Yeah. Some of some of the uh, uh, the stats were from one guy or on another guy's card. There's a lot of little uh, little things like that. That's right. Yeah, I think as I, as I'm recalling, I believe it was Joe Page on the front, and then the back of the card had Johnny Sane's Sane's stats. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so that's, uh, you know, interesting, interesting. Yeah. And you could chalk that up to being a company still relatively new at making baseball cards, sure. but heck all these years later, we still see mistakes like this being made. We still Absolutely. see players mis being misidentified. It's, it's a human factor that never goes away. Absolutely. And then even the backs of the cards, the stock was different, different textures of stock, different colors, black, red, some cream colored. It was like, it just, yeah, right. I, I think it, it had to do with the, with growing pains. Yeah. I think it makes it more fun when you look back. At I, the, I agree. At totally the agree. And you try to collect them as well. Uh, we have Tom some pages from the book um, and you can see there's not only visual images of the cards, but also uh, short biographies of the players and here's just one page. Great sampling here. We've got four Hall of Famers. We've got the two in, well, three infielders, Phil Rizzuto, Jackie Robinson, Red Shandienst. And then we've got a pitcher thrown in, Robin Roberts. Yeah, we, uh, you know what we did? I mean, we, we thought long and hard about how to break up the book. So we decided, obviously, the Hall of Famers should be in the chapter by themselves. But then, as I said, as we as we dug deeper and deeper and started researching the players and the stories behind the players, we decided to rather the hall of famers and everybody's a common after that, we uh, created a chapter called the uncommons. So we have the hall of famers, the uncommons and the commons. Now the commons, you know, are like what this country is built on It's the foundation of every, every industry, the common worker, the common person, the, the, you know, it's, it's really, really the foundation for what this country is built on. The uncommons, on the other hand, there were little things about the uncommons that didn't make them common. You know, a guy like, I don't know, Mel Parnell. Mop, Mel Parnell is not a Hall of Famer, but Mel Parnell was not a common ball player. You know, so he's a good example. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's several of them. Uh, so that's how we decided to, to break up the, uh, the book. And then our colleague uh, out in California, uh, Joe Orlando, um, he was able to really, uh, in the last chapter, delve into the particulars on the, 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 the series itself. Uh, the, you know, the, the, just the way the cards were made, the little idiosyncrasies about the cards, so it all kind of, it really all kind of, of came together. And by the way, I, I want to mention, if I may, Bruce, the, uh, this collection uh, was loaned to us uh, by John Branca. John has one of the highest graded, I think it's the second or third on the registry. And John was nice enough to, uh, to loan us his collection, uh, which we used uh, for the book. And, uh, so you photographed beautiful. all of his graded cards, which is Correct. really uh, beautifully done. Yeah. Now we see a pile of cards with the glove and the ball on the left. They, those are some ungraded cards. Well, there's, so a, here, right, there's a story behind those. Uh, yeah. Last year, you know, uh, the cover of the book, you know, we spent, Ellen and I spent, I can't even tell you how many hours trying to formulate what we envisioned the cover to look like. I wanted the cover of that book to look like it, it. I remember it playing. I call them. We call them in Boston scalers, playing scalers against the wall with my friends. Uh, you know, uh, shooting and uh, flipping cards and, and all of that. So we decided at the last year's national. I'm sorry, two years ago at the national, 
um, I said, well, you know something, I really want to get some really good distressed uh, 52 tops. So one of the big uh, dealers down there, his name is Tom Colleen. Uh, Tom was, uh, we, we spent some time together and we kind of handpicked uh, the cards that we wanted, uh, you know, as loose. And, uh, you know, they, 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 they re- I think they really captured the moment. Yeah. You also included a couple of sticks of bubble gum. We did. Uh, those are not from 1952. Uh, <laughs> however, uh, we were able to secure a couple of those uh, from a, uh, an old timer, uh, an old time car dealer. Uh, I would not advise eating them. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we were able to secure a couple. So that was kind of cool. Yeah. Don't chew these uh, vintage pieces of bubble gum. You might pass out. Absolutely. And the cover, Even if you we- don't pass out, the taste is not going to be particularly good. either. <laughs> the cover you of talked the- about, you talked sorry. about the uncommons earlier and we see them on the right side of the screen. Are you able to make out the players that are shown here in these images? I am not. I'm f- uh, Too small for is, you? Is one of them Dick Grote? Uh, I think that might be Grote on the lower right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, he's, he's a good example. I mean, Dick Grote is a perfect example. He's still with us today, number one. Uh, Dick was a very, very good baseball player, but he was a tremendous uh, uh, basketball player. I mean, you know, he uh, he was an all American, uh, you know, and uh, again, still very vibrant today. He's a good example of, of a uh, uh, an uncommon. Another guy that's, uh, you know, I'm thinking as we're as we're, we're talking, another guy that comes to mind is a guy that we interviewed, uh, Kyle Erskine. Now, mm-hmm. you know, Kyle Kyle is probably 95 now, and we we interviewed him for probably an hour and a half. We had just a wonderful, wonderful uh, 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 time with him. And he's another guy that, you know, he's not in the Hall of Fame, but he's not a common by any stretch of the imagination. Absolutely. I believe above Dick Road is Alvin Dark, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Yeah. Al Dark here. Uh, Yep, it is. And again, another... A, a, another player that doesn't fit into that Hall of Fame mode, but again, he's not a common. I mean, every one of these, every one of these players in the uncommon mode had several good to very good seasons. Some of them were pitches that you know. Some of them won twenty games, two, three, four years. Um, some of them became great managers. Uh, so again, that's that was my favorite chapter because. There was a little something about every one of the players in that chapter. Tom, one thing I've always been curious about the 52 set, are all of the cards colorized or do some of them feature actual color photographs? Uh, I believe they, every single one of them was colorized. There may have been one or two. I'm not, uh, I'm not totally sure, but I know if they were, they were colorized. Every one I believe was whether some were touched up, some were fully colorized. I think uh, I think that's the way it worked. Yeah. In a lot of cases, it's beautifully done. I mean, you really have to look closely to see that it's not an authentic color photograph. It is a Absolutely. black and white. That's As you said up. earlier, I mean, they look like, like they were taken with a camera. They yeah. look like, you know, just beautiful, vivid pictures. And you have to look really, really closely, uh, you know, at them to, to you know, to make sure. And the photographer that we, uh, that we use for the book and we've used her for, her name is Chrissy Good. She's out of California. She did a wonderful job capturing those, capturing the images on the page breaks, uh, the cover, you know, as I said, the cover, we spent hours, those two kids on the front cover, uh, that shot, uh, that photo shoot was done in Southern California in the middle of the summer. And those two kids literally were out there for about seven or eight hours because we were back here in Boston and I visualized what I was looking for. We had a crew out there and we were FaceTiming. And so, you know, I would, I would ask the photographer to tell the kid on his left to move his hand down about six inches, the guy on the right to move, you know, to move his foot. It really took a long time. And these two kids, 
They were such troopers. Uh, they just did a phenomenal job. Um, we're, we're very, very, very proud of the cover of that book. Very nice. Uh, we have one of our viewers, uh, Stephen Cheskin, points out uh, the other two players on the Uncommon page are Ted Klozuski. He's in the upper right. Clue. I had thought it was Klozuski. I then noticed that he's got the Actually, full sleeves, which fooled me. But that yeah. is Ted Klozuski. Absolutely, Stephen, you're right. And then he points out that the player in the lower left is Jackie Jensen, who is a very good outfielder, but had a fear Jackie, of flying, which yeah, cuts I mean, Jackie, he's, he's a perfect example of an uncommon because Jackie was a very, very good player, very good Red Sox player, but his career was cut short by design because he was afraid to get on an airplane. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, that's the thing. Those are the guys, those are the stories that really, really, really intrigued us, you know? Absolutely. I want to point out to our viewers that Tom is the author of numerous books on baseball collectibles, along with his wife. Um, they live in the Boston area. If you were not uh, uh, sort of uh, led on by the accent, uh, <laughs> we can point that out. My, my uh, and Tom also <laughs> hosts an Italian-themed radio show as well, which I find very interesting. Tell me a little bit about that, Tom. Well, we, yeah, I, I actually host two shows, uh, as you know. Um, the, I, I co-host a show. We've been on uh, Boston Radio for going on 20 years now. And it's, it's called East. I'm Italian, as I'm sure you know. Uh, and my partner is Italian. And the name of the show is called The Sicilian Corner. And basically, it's kind of a humorous show. As I said, we've been on the air for 20, 20 years. We have a great following. And it's basically an Italian version of Seinfeld. <laughs> That's basically what it is. Um, we, it's very self-deprecating. I kind of wear a different hat for this show, for yeah. that show, because uh, we've been doing it for so long, and people seem to enjoy it. So we're on uh, every Friday. And then, uh, I obviously, I co-host... Uh, uh, a radio and video podcast called The Great American Collectible Show. And my partner is uh, Rico, Rico Petroselli. Uh, and uh, my other co-host is uh, Boston radio and TV sports guy, sports personality, John Mallory. So uh, we, I co-host with them and we've been on the air now uh, for three years. Mm. And we're on Boston radio up here. And then we're on, it's a video podcast and our landing page, we have, a, there's a lot of different landing pages, but we're on the uh, Sports Collectors Daily uh, Facebook page. It's a live show, uh, PSAs, our own Facebook page. And then a lot of our, a lot of the sponsors share the show. So that's a fun show. Yeah. And uh, it's a collectible show. Primarily cards we talk about. We talk about the different series, T206s, T205s. Uh, Gaudis, uh, and then we talk some sports memorabilia, bats, game-worn uniforms, things like that. Yeah, we hope to have Rico and you on uh, at a future date. Uh, we look forward to doing that. When I used to work in the Utica area, I had a chance to interview Rico a couple of times uh, because the Red Sox had a minor league affiliate in Utica, New York, the Utica Blue Sox. Uh, Rico was involved in the organization, uh, and he was one of the uh, people that worked with the young players. He traveled around to the affiliates. Absolutely. Uh, so one interesting, else. one interesting thing quickly about uh, Rico Bruce is that he 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 played at a very very unique time, which made it makes it for interesting conversation. Because when Rico broke in, I mean, guys like you know Robin Roberts and uh, you know uh, Hoyt Wilhelm, a lot of the old timers were were still playing. And then he really played through two generations because when by the time he, he was done, he was playing with guys like Dennis Eckersley and Goose Gossage and Robin Yount. So he really played in two different eras. And Rico grew up in, in, in Brooklyn, and he was an extremely passionate Dodgers and Yankees fan. And, and Mickey Mantle was his hero. Yeah. He was his hero. And Rico said the first time he faced uh, – the first time he met – uh, 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 Mickey, I think he got a base hitter. He walked and Mickey's legs were bothering him. So they had Mickey at first base. And as Rico is ru running up the baseline, he's like petrified. What am I going to say to this guy? This is my idol. This is my hero. So he tries to be cool and he, you know, steps in the bag, takes a little lead, 
And he's saying to himself, should I call him Mr. Mantle? What should I do? And Mick says, hey, Rico, how you doing? <laughs> Rico said, I almost fainted on the spot. <laughs> Very good. Rico was one of the few Red Sox who was part of both the 67 Impossible Dream and then that great 1975 team. That Absolutely. The Big Red Machine. Absolutely. Uh, and Tom he's has also written some other books as well, along with his wife, Ellen. Uh, here's the Cracker Jack Collection, Baseball's Prized Players. Uh, looking back at those uh, very popular Cracker Jack cards of the uh, 1910s. And then here we have uh, the book with Rico Petroselli, an all-stars cardboard memories, just two of the many collectible baseball books that uh, the Zapalas have put out. Uh, we are going to take some questions uh, from our audience members. To do that, we asked you to go into the Zoom group chat. That's where you can type in your questions. And while you're thinking about questions that you can ask of Tom, uh, we do want to remind folks that there's a great way that you can support the Baseball Hall of Fame, and that is through the Hall of Fame's membership program. Fans from around the country and around the world can be part of the team that is preserving the game's history and celebrating the all-time greats. Uh, members receive a full roster of benefits, which include unlimited admission to the museum for a full year, and also six copies of our magazine. So that's all six copies that come out each year. That's Memories and Dreams, great publication. Now, for many, the benefits of membership cannot be held solely in their hands. Their membership brings with it the knowledge that they are part of baseball's history. Uh, we hope that you can be a part of something greater. Support the Hall of Fame. Uh, visit baseballhall.org slash join. Again, that's baseballhall.org slash join. All right, we'll start taking some questions from our audience. Uh, Reg Jones has chipped in with a few comments and questions. Reg wants to know, Tom, you're much too young to have been around at the time. So I'm curious as to why you have the T206 as your favorite cards. That's a great question. Um, it, this goes back to, believe it or not, a visit to Cooperstown uh, with my son. My son is now 39 years old and we decided to um, take a ride into Cooperstown when he was probably seven or eight because I loved the, it's just a wonderful, wonderful community. And I was, we were in, the, uh, there used to be a, a, a store on, on Main Street called the National Pastime. A cool store, it was almost like an antique shop. Make a long story short, I found a T206 card and I grabbed it and I, I didn't know a thing about them. And I said, well, this, this card will look really cool on my desk. Brought the card home, framed it, Stuck it on my desk, and I stayed at that card for probably a year. Finally, I, and I finally I said, I wonder if this guy was any good. The player's name was Lena Blackburn. So I started researching Lena Blackburn. Come to find out that Lena was not a very good ball player. As a matter of fact, he was pretty bad. However, he made a contribution to the game that is still in effect today. Uh, Lena Blackburn was the guy that discovered the mud rubbing uh, uh, material that they use today in baseball still to take the sheen off of the baseball. And it's a proprietary, uh, uh, it was a proprietary, uh, uh, I believe it was a Delaware river. He yeah. found it in some mud bank. And I, I, I found that that was an intriguing, intriguing story. So then I started picking up a few more cards. And again, the stories behind the players is what really caught my fancy um, I wasn't concerned about the values of the card. It was just the stories behind the players. Uh, I think, uh, you know, there's, you know, tons of them. So that's, that's why I got into it. And then I started collecting them and uh, I've been working on, on it for a long time. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Lena Blackburn, a big part of baseball's lore and legacy. Absolutely. Uh, we have a question or a comment rather from Scott Blake. Uh, he points out Warren Spahn fought in the Battle of the Bulge, also got a bad case of frostbite, which almost caused him to lose some toes. And he is part of that 1952 set as well. Absolutely. I would say that of the 407, I would say that at least 70 to 75 percent of them participated in either World War II or the Korean War. And Warren is just another example of players that, 
you know, these aren't guys that, uh, you know, sat in offices. Um, some of them did play for teams, but many of them saw some, some I'm talking Battle of the Bulge, uh, D-Day. Yeah, it's, you're making a good point. Question from Terry Vasquez. What were some of the other reasons players were not in the 52 top set uh, besides the Bauman contract, the Korean War connection? Were there any other reasons, other factors why some players were excluded? I think I think there were uh, some other players, some lesser players that were on the contract with Bauman also. I mean, it just so happens that, you know, Stan Musial was a superstar at the time, but there were there were other players that were under contract with Bauman. And I think the other thing was, I, I think that Cy, I, I'm not I'm not sure about this, and this is a good. I'm, I'm glad you're raising this question because I'm going to ask his son. Uh, I think that he he just wanted to limit the number of uh, of players, and I'm not sure that every player. Uh, I'm not sure every player was under contract. I think there were some players that were just left out, to be honest with you. That's interesting. Now, I'm going to do some quick math here. You had 16 teams at the time and roughly 25 players per right. team. This is really going to test my uh, my math skills here. Let's see I can do this. Uh, so that's going to give us 400 players. Now, there's 407 that are in the set, but in the course of a given season, you're players going to have come players and go. coming and going. Exactly. You're going to have players released, players who are signed, players promoted from the minor leagues. So it's by conservative estimates, I'm going to say at least 450 to 500 guys played. I, I would agree with in that. 1951. So it seems like he kept some of the backup, some of the lesser players some of the younger players out of the equation. And I agree with that. Again, I'm not sure how many were under contract with Bauman, but I would say that that's probably the case, that he did leave some of the lesser players out. All right. We have just a couple of minutes uh, remaining uh, with our guest. His name, Tom Zappala. Uh, he and his wife, Ellen, have written uh, this beautiful new book, uh, Baseball and Bubblegum, the 1952 Tops Collection. It has been uh, selling very well in our bookstore here at the Baseball Hall of Fame. And if you go to our Zoom group chat, it is available uh, from the link that we have put up. Um, and that basically is shop.baseballhall.org and then slash uh, search dot php question mark. And there's all sorts of stuff after that as well. I'm not going to, you're not going to be able to memorize it from there. But if you look at it on the screen in the Zoom group chat, uh, you can certainly write it down from there. And uh, uh, that will uh, give folks an opportunity uh, to go to the link, purchase the book directly, and not only purchase the book directly, but also get a book that is signed by both Tom and Ellen. Um, let's talk a little bit, Tom, in our last couple of moments here. What's it been like putting out a book in the year of the pandemic? I imagine it's not been easy. I'm sure it's it, been a it's, learning experience, but give us a taste. I mean, publishing is a wild business to begin with. This year, though, must be particularly so. Well, it's been challenging, uh, to say the least. Um, we were very fortunate that for some reason this book struck a nerve um, throughout the collectibles world and with baseball uh you know, purists, people that just love the game of baseball. Uh, because, you know, obviously, uh, as we were talking before the show started, uh, we were not typically, uh, the, our books are launched at the National Sports Collectors Convention, and they do it up pretty well for us. I mean, it's a, it's a major sports, it's a major book launch. This year, obviously, there was no, there was no national. And the other thing is that, you know, typically, uh, at, when a book comes out for Ellen and I, we're doing book signings all over the place, at least uh, two or three or four a week, and we haven't done any. So it's been kind of refreshing, but yet it's been challenging because, quite frankly, it's a lot of work to do, you know, to, to travel, to do the book signings. But the book has done phenomenally well, uh, you know, uh, uh, on uh Amazon and, uh, you know, with, with other, other outlets. So it has been challenging. Um, 
we love to get out to meet and chat with people. I think that's my biggest regret, you know, not being able to sit and just chew the fat with somebody on this particular book or collection. So it's been tough. We're going to close with one question from our audience, uh, from Stephen. I really enjoyed looking through the book. It was interesting to see how many of those players became managers of my youth. Did you notice that as well? Uh, the answer that yes, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a, there's a ton of them, but I think Steve, that it's, if you look at any period, any period of time, uh, with baseball, I think that happens. I think that's an evolution. I mean, you can go back to, you know, the pre-war stuff, uh, the 1920s, uh, go back into the T206, T205 collection, and you'd be surprised as, as to how many of those players became managers later on. I think that's pretty much the evolution of the process. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you look at some of, the, some of the managers today. They played 20 years ago, 25 years ago, you know. Yeah. So well, that I was think it's, the it's an evolution. In the 1950s. That may not be the case, though, years from now, Tom, given the trend to go to younger managers, some of whom have never played in the major league I, and some of whom only played a little in the minor leagues. I think that I agree with you. I agree with you on that one, Bruce, because the whole dynamics uh, of managing has changed today. And I, I'm not sure that they're, they're looking necessarily for that, 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 that guy that played for 10 or 12 or 15 years. I think they're, they're, they're more looking for that analytical guy, the guy that really uh, uh, thinks with the modern, you know, uh, with the whole uh, concept of managing in, in, a, in modern times. I agree with you. I don't, I, there's not going to be as many. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, certainly one of the many ways the game has changed. Uh, our guest has been Tom Zappala, author of Baseball and Bubblegum. The 1952 Tops Collection. You can see the uh, cover photograph that Tom is rightly proud of there. Tom and his wife, Ellen, co-authored this with some help from a number of other people. Uh, great photography throughout the book. Biographies about the players and information about the 1952 Tops set. Tom, it's been a real pleasure to have you on. I always love talking about baseball cards. Uh, I don't know as much about the 52 set as I do about later years. So it was a learning experience for me. Uh, we do appreciate your time. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, Bruce, and uh, my best to you. And uh, stay safe and be well. And um, if we can get things back to normal in 2021, maybe we'll have you and Ellen out here at the Hall of Fame. How's that sound? Love to, love to join you guys. Yeah, we'd like to try to do that as well. Again, our thanks to Tom Zappala, co-author of Baseball and Bubblegum, the 1952 Tops Collection. We hope you've enjoyed this program uh, delivered live from Boston and from Cooperstown, New York. Have a great day, everybody. Take care. Take care now. Thank you.